Hello and welcome everybody to this first webinar with our talented teacher, Kimi Lea and Vithulkas Kompas on homeopathic treatment on asthma. I would like to thank you for taking uh, the time to join us today as Kim will talk and show us on how to treat asthma with homeopathy. Welcome, Kim. Nice to see you and nice to hear you. Thank you, Elena. I appreciate being here. Should I go ahead and get started, Elena? Yes, please. Okay, all right. So welcome everyone. And first of all, thank you, Elena, and thank you to Vitokas Compass for inviting me to present today. I'm very excited about sharing a little bit of my own experience with um, homeopathy in the treatment of asthma. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, did you wanna mention anything about, uh, I think this session is being recorded. Is that correct, Elena? Yes, correct. The session is being recorded. Yeah. And did you, uh, wanna, did you wanna mention something about the- Yes. Uh, I'm gonna stop yes. sharing, let you share for a second, okay? You're gonna- uh, No, no, I will share, share afterward. I will share after. I will just announce that uh, um, due to this webinar and due to you doing this, these lectures and this teaching, anyone who would be interested in buying Bithulkas Compass as a subscription plan, we will be offering a 20% discount. So the floor is yours, Kim. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. So let's go ahead and get started. So thank you, everybody. And the topic for today's presentation is the homeopathic treatment of asthma. And this is a condition that I'm particularly um, happy to work with using homeopathy because it's something which responds very, very well to the art and science of our incredible system of medicine. Hold on, I just gotta get rid of this thing here. Okay, all right. So we know that asthma is essentially the obstruction or impediment of the air passages in the lungs. And this is a, a condition which has been on the rise, especially in the last few decades. We're seeing more and more instances of people with asthma, both children, adults, teenagers, um, infants even sometimes. And part of this is the result of the use of various types of conventional medications, which can suppress other conditions and eventually result in asthma. But as I said, asthma is a condition which responds very, very well to homeopathic intervention. Now I've done here an extraction just to show you the main remedies that come up when you type in the word asthma in our literature, and you can see some very well-known remedies like arsenicum album, natrium sulfuricum, ipecacuana, sulfur, calicarbonica, metarinum, nux vomica, lobelian flata, carboveg, blata orientalis cuprum, and so on and so forth. And these are all fairly common remedies that we employ when we're dealing with asthma. Here I typed in acute asthma just to see if there were certain specific remedies that would be indicated in the acute manifestation of an asthma attack. As you know, there can be acute asthma attacks, but there can also be more chronic asthma or there can be periodical asthma, which comes on every period, every season or every number of months. Uh, here we can see arsenicum, ipecacuana, nuxfamica, uh, moschus moschiferus, the Himalayan musk deer, calibac Chromicum, Veratrum viridi, Thuya, Sambuca, Snigra, Elderberry, and so on and so forth. And if we do the same thing for chronic asthma, we see a different grouping of remedies. Uh, interestingly enough, we see cephalinum coming up very high, but we see also sulfur, arsenicum, natrium sulfuricum, which was not in acute asthma so prominently, but does come up very strongly for chronic asthma. So some of the important polycrest remedies that we frequently employ when we're working with asthma include remedies like arsenicum, natrium sulfuricum, sulfur, nuxfamica, calicarbonicum, pulsodilla, lacosystuia, silica, phosphorus, aconite, calcarea carbonica, lycopodium, ignatia, chamomilla, and brionia alba. These are all fairly commonly used remedies when dealing with this condition. There are also some less well-represented remedies in our literature, remedies that are not as commonly found in the repertories or materia medicas, which are also frequently used when dealing with asthma. And these include remedies like ipecacuana, metarinum, cuprum, lobelia inflata, spongia tosta, blata orientalis, sambucus nigra, aurelia racemosa, antimony tartaricum, sanguinaria, canadensis, grindalia, Mephites, Carboveg, Senega, Dalkmara, and Ammonium Carbonicum. So these are all fairly frequently used remedies for this particular problem. 
We can have remedies from the mineral kingdom like calicarbonicum. We can have uh, vegetable matter, which has been broken down like carbo veg. We can have animal remedies like the Indian cockroach or blada orientalis. And then we can have many different plant remedies like ipecacuana, sambucus nigra, which is elderberry, senega, which is particularly useful with, with elderly people who've got asthma. The key here is we always need to, in homeopathy, to individualize. We always need to find that remedy which most closely approximates the totality of characteristic symptoms which the patient is manifesting. We need to do this if we want to get fantastic results in practice. We can't think that, oh, there's a group of remedies that we think of for asthma, and we just simply give these group of remedies a specifics for that condition. No. Hahnemann very clearly in aphorism 153 of the organon says that we need to focus on the more striking, strange characteristic signs and symptoms of the disease, and that more general symptoms such as weakness, headache, or malaise deserve little or no attention unless qualified by modality. So we always need to individualize. Hahnemann is always advising us to do so. And if we do individualize, we can see the incredible results that homeopathy has to offer us. So let's go ahead now and do a case. And let's individualize that case and see if we can kind of come up with a good remedy that can help this particular patient. So I'm going to go ahead now, Elena, and I'm going to read through the case. And I'm going to ask the participants to mark down what you think is important, because I'm going to ask you to tell me what you think I should focus on in this particular situation. Coming up with the remedy, of course, is important, but what's most important is to be able to identify what is striking and characteristic in any particular case. You always do that first. Once you've done that, then finding the remedy should be fairly easy. So I'm going to go ahead now and read through the case, and please jot down what you think is important, and then Elena will convey back to me what you think I should focus on. So Sam was a 60-year-old man who had suffered for many years from periodical attacks of asthma, which would come on either during the winter or spring, but regardless, always at least once a year. The attacks would always start the same way, but had been getting progressively worse over the years. And they would always start with a cold and cough, eventually progressing into full-blown asthma. Interestingly, once he would recover from the attack, Sam would be in perfect health until the next time he would get a cold. Sam came to see me during one of these periodical attacks. So he's now in his acute expression of the asthma at this moment. Sam had the following symptoms, spasmodic cough with wheezing and a feeling of constriction in the chest. Sam also had excessive sputum or saliva with a salty taste. And his symptoms were strongly aggravated at night, especially right after falling asleep. He would wake up in a state of panic as if he was going to suffocate. And he would be ameliorated by sitting up with his body bent forward. This position would dramatically ameliorate his symptoms. If he would lay back down, the suffocated feeling would return right away. As a child, Sam had hay fever, but since moving to a drier climate, the hay fever had largely disappeared. There weren't a lot of other symptoms other than being sensitive to cold weather and especially cold drafts. Sam was also somewhat sensitive to hot weather, but not as much as the cold weather. Sam could also couldn't stand cigarette smoke and was especially aggravated by it when he had one of these respiratory bouts. Okay, so that's the case. Elena, has anybody typed in some suggestions as to what they think is important or what we should focus on? You're muted, Elena. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I, well, we I, have I'm practicing my lip reading, but I haven't really. <laughs> no, for the moment, for the moment, we don't have anything very specific. Yeah. Um, we have, um, sorry, just a second because, okay, um, constriction of, of chest, night after midnight sitting up is one, nocturnal asthma is another, body bent forward improves is another, but I think you should continue. 
Yeah, those are very good. So let me let me just address some of those. So yes, okay. obviously. Um, now, there's no question that this patient is very strongly aggravated lying down and better sitting up. So this is a very important modality in the case. And I agree with you, it's something we have to put our attention on. The only problem with that particular symptom is it's very common in respiratory issues for people to be worse laying down and better sitting up. And as a matter of fact, most of our remedies, blotta orientalis, ipecacuana, calicarbonicum, hyoscyamus, on and on and on, are almost always ameliorated sitting up and aggravated lying down. One of the few remedies I can think of, which is actually ameliorated lying down, is manganum, especially in the middle of the day. So even though this is true of the case, it won't necessarily help you to differentiate a remedy because so many other remedies also have this particular symptom. So I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just saying it may not be all that helpful in ascertaining the appropriate remedy. Here's Any other some suggestions more. here? Well, here goes some more. Uh, uh, spasmodic cough wheezing. Okay, salty good. taste in saliva. Yes, now that's a very good one. The reason the salty taste is so interesting is because it's unusual. Usually for people when they have respiratory issues, they're not going to tell you that they have a salty taste in their mouth. So because that's more unusual, because that's more characteristic and striking, that will help to differentiate this case from other cases. Uh, there's another one from uh, Richard Derry who says cold and cough, spasm, cough wheezing, constriction of chest, uh, sputum excessive, aggravation at night after sleep, wakes up with panic, bend forward, ameliorates, like you said before, uh, bend for, uh, and lying down aggravates. Very good. Okay, those are all correct, absolutely. Any other symptoms anybody wants to mention? Uh, they have here, there's another symptom here, cigarette smoking aggravates when there's an attack. Yes. Um, somebody's asking is if there is a specific time for the aggravation. Yes, it, one? It's, speci it's specifically, at the, the worst is when at nighttime, when he goes to sleep is when specifically when he gets the worst. Very sensitive with cold draft. Yes, absolutely. There's one thing that no one has yet mentioned, which is very unusual or peculiar about this case, which differentiates it from other cases. Can anybody tell me what that is? Everything you've said is correct, but there's one thing in particular which is very unusual. There's one, one here, suffocation after falling asleep. Okay. Uh, so the thing that this thing, Elena, that strikes me as being interesting in this case is the fact that he gets these attacks like once a year. And in between, he's completely well. There's no issues whatsoever. There's no respiratory problems at all. That's a little bit peculiar. And that's interesting in this case. And I think it's something to pay attention to. Yeah, I think you got one from, just give me one second. Yes, you got this from Willy Kiestra, who says periodically ah. and once a year. Hi, Willy. In, nice to see you. Willy's a friend of mine. So nice uh, and you. in spring, it aggravates. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Willy. Okay, so uh, would anybody like to suggest a remedy? Any remedy suggestions here? Psorinum looks interesting. Which one? Psorinum. Serena, okay, very yes. cold, sensitive to drafts. Aralia. Um, hay, hay, hay fever, big remedy for hay fever, serinum. Um, but uh, the nighttime aggravation, uh, falling asleep, not so prominent. Uh, the sitting up being better, not so strong in serinum. So yeah, I can see why you suggested serinum, but I think there's a better choice here. Yes, we have more. Just give me one second. There are many coming in. Natrium muriaticum, arsenicum, aralia, lycosis, not muriaticum. Yeah, so again, let me lycosis. address some of these. Lacosis, of course, falling to sleep, waking up in a state of panic as if you're choking and suffocating, well-known symptom of lacosis. But lacosis would not be aggravated by cold. They would be ameliorated by cold. Same thing with natrium muriaticum, you know, generally tends to be a warm remedy aggravated by the sun. So not quite fitting this case. Uh, give me a couple of other ones. Arsenicum album. Arsenicum album, very cold as well. Um, aggravated by cold, sensitive to drafts, <coughs> sensitive to cigarette smoke. The salty taste is not so characteristic in arsenicum. 
Uh, we have Lycasis also. Yeah, we mentioned Lycasis, but Lycasis is warm. Okay, these are excellent suggestions. Let's, uh, let me show you what I thought were the important symptoms. So what struck it, stuck out to me as being interesting in this case uh, was the periodicity of the attacks where they were completely well in between. I thought that was very interesting. The constriction of the chest, the salty taste, the aggravated at night right after falling asleep, the ameliorated by sitting up with the body bent forward, the sensitive to cold weather and especially cold drafts, and the fact that they were extremely sensitive to cigarette smoke in general, and especially when they were having a respiratory problem. So actually somebody during the um, call did actually mention the remedy that was prescribed, and the remedy that was prescribed in this case was... Da, 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 <laughs> was the Aurelia racemosa, which I gave in one, one dose, 200 C. Now, um, I put this case into the Vitolkis Compass software, and I selected um, the results, not the flat repertorization, but the, the use of the algorithms in the program. And I used, you can see on the left-hand side here, saltish taste, asthmatic respiration, lying aggravates, uh, sensitive to drafts, lying at night aggravates, and aggravated from all kinds of smoke. And by putting in those uh, six individual symptoms, you can see on the right-hand side that the Vitolkis Compass software suggests Aurelia racemosa. And if you look to the right of Aurelia racemosa, you can see that it says result is clear. In other words, there's no question according to Vitolkis Compass that in this particular circumstance that we need to give the remedy Aurelia racemosa. And interestingly enough, if you read George Vitolkis's Materia Medica Viva, he actually writes, it is characteristic of this remedy to be symptomatic only during such respiratory events, which entail severe suffering and which make, may last for a few weeks each time and to remain free of the difficulty in breathing during the often lengthy intervals in between. And that's exactly what we saw in this particular case. Here's a photograph of Aurelia racemosa. This is a, a, a plant which is uh, native to the eastern United States. It mostly grows in rich woodland areas. And it was traditionally called spikenard. And uh, it was used in the Americas for coughs. And usually they would use a tincture that was prepared from the fresh root. If you um, do an extraction from the repertory for Aurelia racemosa, just to see which chapters it's most commonly located in, you will see that it has a very strong affinity for respiration. This is a remedy that particularly affects any types of problems that affect the lung or respiratory system in general. George Patolkis, in his Materia Medica Viva, writes, it seems this is Aurelia racemosa. It seems that the constitution becomes weaker every year, allowing the common colds to purchase a deeper hold upon the bronchi. It is characteristic of this remedy to be symptomatic only during such respiratory events, which entail severe suffering and which may last for a few weeks each time, and to remain free of the difficulty in breathing during the often lengthy intervals in between, exactly what we saw in this particular case. Continuing, Patolkus writes, unfortunately, we do not often immediately think of this remedy in such situations. If you have treated such a case for a long time, having noted the recurring pattern of the lung weakness year after year, you will almost certainly have prescribed tuberculinum without effect. Again, sense up to cold and drafts, better sitting up, so on and so forth. You may have also treated such cases with other remedies, such as allium sepa, because of the initially acrid discharge from the nose, or calibichromicum, because of the viscid, thick, you know, sticky mucus, or calicarbonicum, because of a sensitivity to cold and drafts and a nighttime aggravation, or perhaps Sambucus nigra with the asthma, where when the asthma persists for hours during the night and is accompanied by profuse perspiration, or ipecacuana, when, as these patients sometimes do, your patient complains of nausea with the coughing. However, 
these patients will have continued to return year after year for the same ailments characterized by the tendency to catch colds which travel into the bronchi, causing a spasmodic cough and difficulty breathing. And the reality is they have required Aurelia racemosa all along. So if you've got cases where you've been giving remedies like tuberculinum and calibicromicum and calicarbonicum and sambucus nigra and maybe ipecacuana, and without the results that you're looking for, consider Aurelia racemosa as a possible remedy in those types of circumstances. So again, one of the big characteristics that Vitolkas describes is this com being completely well between each bout of a respiratory problem. This is one of the grand characteristics or striking characteristics of this particular remedy. Okay, so let's see what happens. This is the first follow-up. I spoke to the patient a day after taking the remedy, and he was generally feeling much better. The spasmodic cough and wheezing were gone, and the chest constriction, although still there, was much better. However, he was now expressing anxiety about the chest constriction. He was so concerned that he wanted to go to the hospital. He was afraid that if the constriction persisted, that he could die. So, Eleno, can you ask the audience, what do I do here? Yes, we this have. This is we're where I refer to another practitioner, right? I just we are waiting for more suggestions on the um, on the chat. We have one from okay. Richard Derry, your friend Arsenicum. He says, "Okay, Arsenicum album." Okay. <laughs> uh, so we have... to, before, actually, the truth is that before suggesting a remedy, you should decide whether you want to switch remedies or not. But I agree with Richard. This person, you can't leave them like this in a state of anxiety where they feel that they're going to die. You, you can't leave them like that, okay? So I agree that we need to switch remedies. Does anybody have any other suggestions, Elena? Yes, uh, one says uh, placebo, another one says lobelia, another one says aconite, another one says to wait, another one says to repeat the same remedy. Okay, so very interesting, very good suggestions, okay. Um, my opinion is you cannot leave the patient in this state. I'm not going to give a higher dose because I don't want to make them even more anxious and more fearful and, and end up driving them to the hospital. So in this type of a circumstance, when the symptoms become worse in a particular way, and the patient is suffering more, more than they were previously, which is really the case here. He's really suffering terribly. Um, I would argue that you have to switch the remedy. Uh, I agree with Richard. To me, it seemed very clear uh, without even thinking about it too much that this was uh, an indication for the remedy arsenicum album. So, um, and somebody mentioned arsenicum album as a remedy. So I ended up giving arsenicum album 200C one dose and during the second follow-up, this is 24 hours after taking the arsenicum, the patient reported no improvement in the chest constriction or anxiety. He said he felt like there was a weight on his chest, and this made him extremely fearful. He was having difficulty breathing and would hyperventilate from the fear. He was still better from sitting up and aggravated from the cold. So, it's very obvious here that the arsenicum prescription was not a good prescription. It did not improve any of the symptoms of the patient. And as a matter of fact, the patient is becoming worse. His symptoms are aggravating. So although it seemed obvious to me that, you know, without thinking about it too much, that this person needed arsenicum album, on reflection, I realized afterwards that arsenicum was not a good prescription. And actually, Elena, you, one of the people actually mentioned the remedy that was the correct prescription here. And that correct prescription was lobelia inflata and not arsenicum. Yeah, you had a couple more now after your explanation that have come up with, with lobelia, actually. We came up with a very good. 
Excellent, excellent. You know, and lobelia and flat and arsenicum are similar remedies. You know, and somebody even mentioned aconite. Aconite was a reasonable suggestion as well. Somebody who's in a state of hyperventilation and panic and very fearful and afraid that they're going to die, predicting the time of death. You know, these are symptoms of arsenicum and aconite. These are very reasonable remedy suggestions for sure. Okay, if we put these particular symptoms into the Vitolcus compass, you can see here I've uh, put in the symptoms anxiety hypochondriacal. Uh, just so you know, the, the old definition of this term is different from the contemporary definition. Today, we understand this to mean anxiety about health, but 150 years ago, it actually meant a gloomy and despondent focus on your health. So just so you're aware that this term has changed its meaning to a certain extent over the over the last 150 years. You can see I chose anxiety with difficult with impeded respiration, difficulty breathing, cold air aggravates, uh, difficulty breathing, lying aggravates. Here's a very interesting difficult uh, difficult psychogenic nervous difficulty breathing, interesting symptom, the uh, tension, tightness, asthmatic constriction, and then the worse from drafts of air. And uh, putting those symptoms in, you can see again, the Tolkis compass says result is clear, no question about it. And the remedy is lobelia inflata. Now, actually, I should have known lobelia inflata instead of arsenicum because if you look at relationship of remedies, because we know uh, starting with uh, Clemens von Maria Berninghausen in the last chapter of his therapeutic pocketbook repertory, the chapter which we call concordances, we know that there are relationships of remedies. Berninghausen was the first person to introduce this particular concept into homeopathy. And we know based on the clinical experience of previous practitioners that certain remedies will complement and follow well after other remedies. And if you look at Aurelia Racemosa, you will find that its first and primary complementary remedy is lobelia inflata. So just that knowledge alone should have moved me more towards lobelia inflata than arsenicum, but Patulcus Compass software anyway told me that I need to give lobelia inflata as well. And if you go and you read a description of lobelia inflata in Berkey, you can see he writes anxiety about health, hypochondriacal, presentiment of death. In other words, you, you, you're believing that you're going to die with oppression of the chest, difficulty of breathing, panics from fear, and hyperventilation. There, here's a picture of lobelia inflata. This is uh, known as Indian tobacco. And uh, this is found uh, all over North America, especially in the Eastern seaboard. Uh, you can find it in pastures and cultivated fields all the way from Eastern Canada down to Georgia. This was uh, used by the Native Americans in North America to treat asthma and other types of various respiratory problems. The Thompsonians, which was a group of healthcare practitioners here in North America, would use it for almost everything. I mean, literally any health problem that you would have, they would give Indian tobacco for. Uh, from a homeopathic perspective, uh, it's used for many different types of conditions. You want to study it in comparison with Aurelia racemosa. It shares many similar symptoms, which is one of the reasons it's complementary to Aurelia. You'll also want to study it in combination with Ipecacuana. Again, many similar symptoms, including the nausea and respiratory types of problems. And it's a very, very good remedy. It's probably almost a specific for asthma during labor. So if you have a woman uh, that during uh, labor develops an asthma attack, uh, you'll want to think of this remedy very, very strongly. Okay, so she's given lobelia inflata. The third follow-up is 12 hours after taking the lobelia inflata and the patient's anxiety and chest constriction oppression are completely gone. He now has a slight cough and some nasal congestion, but the asthma symptoms are almost completely disappeared. I think it's fairly obvious to everybody on the call that in such a circumstance, we're simply going to wait. Uh, whenever there's such a dramatic result from a single dose of a remedy, uh, the recommendation is always to wait uh, and see how things uh, develop over a period of time. Uh, it might be a little bit different if you're employing the posology methods of the fifth and sixth editions of the organon, wherein you're giving the remedy in solution and succussing between each dose. The approach there might be a little bit different.
The fourth follow-up is now three days after taking the lobelia inflata, and the patient is feeling completely recovered. He still has some nasal congestion and a slight cough, but his energy has improved and his mental symptoms and the chest constriction oppression are totally gone. Now, you might think here, okay, fantastic, the patient's situation is completely resolved, they're cured, and all I need to do is sit back and wait and continue to collect their money. Well, actually, that's not really correct. In this circumstances here, we actually want to take the chronic case of the patient. The prescriptions of Aurelia racemosa and Lobelia inflato really were addressing the acute expression of their asthma during that period of time, but it won't necessarily remove the predisposition towards that particular condition. And if we don't remove that predisposition, I can assure you that these periodical outbreaks will continue. Hahnemann tells us as much in aphorism 221 of the organon. Aphorisms 210 through 230 of the organon is the section of the organon that specifically talks about the homeopathic treatment of mental and emotional diseases. And in aphorism 221, Hahnemann writes, an insanity or frenzy that suddenly breaks out as an acute disease from the patient's usually quiet state may be occasioned by fright, vexation, drinking alcohol, et cetera, but it almost without exception springs from internal sora that as it were, flares up like a flame. Such a case cannot be treated straight away in its acute onset with anti sork or chronic remedies. Rather, it must first be treated with medicines such as aconite, belladonna, stramonium, hyoscyamus, mercury, etc., selected from the other class of proven remedies, i.e. the asorts or non-chronic remedies. These should be given in highly potentized, subtle homeopathic doses in order to dispatch the acute flare-up to such an extent that the sore returns for the present to its previous almost latent state, and here we got it, whereupon the patient appears to recover. So this is what we refer to as an acute exacerbation of the chronic state. It's not a real acute. It's not like the flu. Sorry, I have three things going on at one time. Can you please mute yourself? Um, or a cold that comes through the area or malaria. It's not a real acute. It's an acute exacerbation of your chronic state. It's based on your constitution. And Hahnemann says here that we give certain remedies for this acute exacerbation of the chronic state, which will remove it, but we shouldn't assume that the patient is then cured. He says, whereupon the patient appears to recover. In the following aphorism, he writes, however, a patient who recovers from an acute mental and emotional disease by means of non-chronic medicines should never be regarded as cured. On the contrary, once the acute outbreak has passed, the patient should be given as soon as possible a continued anti sork and possibly anti-syphilitic treatment in order to entirely free him from the chronic miasm from the sora, which is now latent again, but which is very liable to re-erupt in the form of attacks of the previous mental and emotional disease. If such treatment is given, there will be no need to fear any similar future attack as long as the patient faithfully adheres to the dietary regimen prescribed for him. So what Hahnemann is saying here is, look, you gave a remedy for the acute exacerbation of the patient's situation. In this particular case, we gave Aurelia racemosa and Lobelia. We also gave Arsenicum, but that was not a good prescription. And that removed the acute exacerbation. But Hahnemann says that the patient's not cured. We need to now take the chronic case, look for their chronic remedy, give that chronic remedy, and that will remove the predisposition towards these outbreaks. If you don't give the chronic remedy, you can be sure that these outbreaks will continue. Now, some of you might be saying, hey, Hahnemann here is specifically referring to mental and emotional diseases. Uh, so does this still apply to all diseases? Well, in aphorisms 210 and 214, I won't read them now, you can do so on your own, Hahnemann says that the treatment of mental and emotional diseases is essentially the same as the treatment of all diseases. So what Hahnemann says 
in aphorisms 210 through 230 applies not just to mental and emotional diseases, it applies to all diseases. So the fifth follow-up, I took the full chronic case one week after prescribing the lobelia inflata. I prescribed calcarea carbonica 200C based on the overall symptoms of the case. And since that time, it's now been over four years, the patient has not reported any respiratory or other serious problems. And calicarbonicum and calicarbonicum, calcarea carbonica, calicarbonicum, natrium sulfuricum, these are all remedies that we think of uh, for chronic cases of asthma to remove that predisposition. Um, I did want to mention uh, that one of the wonderful features uh, that I really like in the Tolkis Compass that really um, helps you to differentiate in this particular situation, uh, it, can, can everybody please be sure to mute yourselves? Um, you can see here it says the result is clear, but sometimes based on the symptoms that you've selected, it may not say that the result is clear. It might say that you need to underline a little bit differently or add more mental symptoms or any of a number of different things. Maybe the way that you've selected particular symptoms isn't really ideal. Maybe you haven't chosen enough symptoms. So it's asking you to, to clarify and add more information to allow the Vitokas compass to really do its job. Um, once you've done that though, over here, you can see there's a feature here called differential analysis. And if you click on it, this is a wonderful feature that gives you suggestions for different symptoms that you can now add to the analysis to help differentiate which of the remedies is the best choice. Maybe it's not so clear because you haven't selected enough symptoms or unique symptoms that allows the Vitolkas compass to differentiate. And you can even look at the main keynotes of the, the various remedies that are coming up in practice. So this is a lovely little feature that allows you to differentiate top remedies that are coming up as uh, suggestions in the Vitolkas compass program. Okay, um, I want to move on now to talk a little bit about the um, idea of asthma and miasms. But mm -hmm. Elena, are there any questions that I could address quickly before we move on to uh, my next part of my presentation and the next case that I want to present? Actually, you covered everything because they were asking for differentiation between remedies, which you covered. Uh, you talked about lobelia, which you covered. And uh, basically, everybody is um, expressing their appreciation on such a fantastic case. And everybody's saying, what an excellent work you've done. <laughs> That's okay. what I... All right. All right, fine, good enough. All right, so... Um... So I, I want to mention to you, too, that you may not be familiar with the remedy Lobelia purpurescence. Um, it's uh, very similar to Lobelia inflata, but the reason I'm mentioning it to you is because it was a very useful remedy in the treatment of COVID-19 during the early stages of that epidemic. So I just want to mention that that was one of the remedies that we found to be quite useful. Uh, later on, uh, as the epidemic or pandemic developed, uh, one of the remedies that became frequently used was carbonium oxygen azetum. Uh, but early on, lobelia purpurescence was a very useful remedy. Okay, anyway, let's move on now. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Kent and his discussion of asthma, okay, as it relates to miasms. And I'm not going to um, discuss the whole issue of miasms in too much detail now, other than to say that the original definition of miasm that Hahnemann employed and the current definition of miasm is quite different. And this does create problems today in terms of being able to discuss this subject, because if you have a different definition and understanding of the meaning of that word, it's going to be very hard for us to have any type of a reasonable discussion about it. So for Hahnemann, a miasm was simply an infectious disease agent. Today, that term is being used in a very different manner as almost a kind of a filter of qualities that we find in patients and in remedies. But let's set that aside for now. If there's more time, I can clarify that whole issue if there's time for Q&A at the very end. So Kent writes, he says, and he's talking here about asthma. He writes, for years, I was puzzled with the management of asthma. When a person came to me and asked, doctor, can you cure asthma? I would say no. 
But now I am beginning to get quite liberal on asthma since I have learned that asthma is a psychotic disease. In other words, associated with the psychotic miasm. And since I have made judicious application of antipsychotics, I have been able to relieve or cure a great number of such cases. You will find in the history of medicine that wherever asthma was cured, it has been by antipsychotic remedies. That is one of the first things I observed, that outside of psychotics, in other words, remedies that fit the psychotic miasm, you will seldom find a cure for asthma. Continuing, <clears throat> Kent writes, hence it is that silica is one of the greatest cures for asthma. It does not cure every case, but when silica corresponds to the symptoms, you will be surprised to note how quickly it will eradicate it. While Ipecacuana, Spongia, and Arsenicum will correspond just as clearly to the supervening symptoms and to everything that you can find about the case, yet what do they do? They palliate, they repress the symptoms, but your asthma is no better off. Your patient is not cured. Arsenic is one of the most frequently indicated remedies for the relief of asthma. So also are Brionia, Ipecacuana, Spongia, and Carbovegetabilis, but they do not cure, though they relieve surprisingly at times. Where a patient is sitting up, covered with a cold sweat, wants to be fanned by somebody on either side of the bed. Difficulty in breathing is so distressing that it seems almost impossible for the patient to live longer to get another breath. Then carbovegetabilis comes in and gives immediate relief and the patient will lie down and get a very good night's rest. But what is the result? On comes the asthma again, the very next cold. Natrum sulfuricum goes down to the bottom of this kind of a case. If it is hereditary, that is, not long-lived, if it is in a growing subject, natrum sulfuricum goes down to the bottom of such a case and will cure when its symptoms are present. And the symptoms will so often be present. It is because of this deep-seated antipsychotic nature we find in the combination of natrum and sulfur that we have a new state and combination running into the life. Okay, so I don't exactly agree with Kent's interpretation or the way that he's describing this political phenomena, but there's no question that the phenomena that he's describing happens in practice. And that's actually the, what the case that I showed you is demonstrating. I gave Aurelia Racemosa, I gave Lobili and Flata, and those were correct remedy prescriptions for that acute exacerbation of the chronic state. My opinion is that there were no other remedies to give. Those were the correct remedies, but they would are not capable, as Kent wrote, of removing the predisposition towards the asthma. We need, as Hahnemann describes when he's talking about the theory of the miasms, more deeper acting remedies. Whether you correspond this with miasms or not does not matter, but the bottom line is you need a deeper acting remedy to remove the chronic predisposition towards that particular condition. So with that in mind, let's go ahead now and look at another case and see how that applies in this particular situation. Now, I haven't summarized this case. These are just literally mostly my notes as I wrote them down. So I'm gonna read through it fairly slowly. Same ground rules as before. Please jot down what you think is important. The remedy is secondary. First of all, we wanna find what's important. Jot it down. Elena will convey back to me what, what you think is important. And then we'll discuss the prescription and how the case was followed up. So this is a 28-year-old woman with asthma. She says, I've had asthma since I was a child. I've had steroids as a young child. Always have had very bad allergies. I've had hay fever year-round, for which I've taken antihistamines. When I was in my 20s, I saw a natural doctor, and he told me I have gluten intolerance. I feel better with more vegetables. I use my inhaler between three to four times a day. I'm allergic to everything, dogs, cats, etc. And every morning I have to use the inhaler. I feel like I'm smothering. I use it once or twice in the evening, but don't need to use an inhaler at night. 
the asthma is, oops, sorry here, I'm just gonna move this. The asthma is aggravated, hold on. In the, it is aggravated by warmth and humidity, but also very cold weather. Uh, but in temperate weather, I seem to be better. Uh, sometimes a cold drink will make it better and sometimes warm drinks will make it better. I'm obsessed with coffee. I drink a lot of coffee. I do like I do like caffeine in general and I drink a little bit of tea. She was drinking like 10 cups of coffee a day, just so you know, like a tremendous amount. Uh, I have been drinking coffee since I was eight years old. I drink two to three big glasses of water a day and I also drink chamomile tea. Have been having issues with sleeping and this is since her divorce. Normally likes to sleep eight to 10 hours of sleep, but then could not sleep more than four hours a night. This is after the divorce. Then after the divorce, she wanted to sleep all the time. Uh, don't deal with stuff really fast. I have to deal with it in pieces. And then she says, worse in the morning. She feels like a congestion of my lungs with a low grade smothering, like there's a 20 pound weight on my chest. In times of stress, it will feel like my lungs are being squeezed like a, sorry, like a vice. Every once in a while, I feel like I have a real asthma attack with wheezing. Since the divorce, I'm afraid of doing things I've done like horse riding. People say I'm much happier since the divorce. I'm not interested in dating again. I'm not a very emotional person. I don't tend to cry a lot. It took me time to process the divorce. The husband had an affair and I actually felt better because it wasn't about me. He is responsible for his decision. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, that strikes me as being very strange when she said she felt better that her husband had an affair. I know for myself personally, that if my intimate partner had an affair, I wouldn't feel better. So to me, that's a very unusual thing for somebody to say. Um, I've always had headaches, gets a migraine before my period every month. Coffee ameliorates the headaches. Twice a year, I get a headache with spots. And when there is a combination of things going on, I can also get a headache. Also high pollen count will create a headache. Storm will also bring on headaches and change in pressure. Headaches before the storms. She uh, Sleep will help the headaches. And a warm washcloth in the back of the ne neck might help a little. Uh, with the bad headaches, she'll actually get nausea. And she had a depression state. Uh, where she got so depressed, she didn't want to ride her horses. She studied a lot with her first depression. She didn't want to be with friends. She pushed them away, was extremely sad when I went away to college, didn't like being away. She worked hard to spend time with people. <clears throat> uh, personal belief is that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Uh, have been very depressed, but suicide would be such a selfish thing to do to the people who love you. She says, I'm overweight. I love carbohydrates, noodles and rice and processed foods. She gets a sinus infection once a year. She has some moles. She had a urinary tract infection in the past. She's had three in her whole life. Uh, these were from being very busy and not going to the bathroom enough. She has a permanently upset stomach, a low grade of nausea and too much gluten and she'll feel like she has a flu and her joints will hurt. And she says restaurant food seems to aggravate her stomach. She has arthritis in the neck from falling off of a horse and her neck will hurt. She says, I run on a regular basis. It'll clear my mind. She says, I'm extremely driven, likes to be in control, overextended myself in school and had two panic attacks. My mom is a really anxious person too. She goes to sleep on her stomach and ends up on her sides or her back. And she's restless when I when she sleeps. She used to wake up feeling refreshed. Now she just feels tired. She likes fall or spring. She says, I like being out in the sun. She sleeps covered up, but she does stick her feet out from underneath the covers. She prefers dry weather. She says, I definitely don't like humid weather. She had a head injury from falling off of horses. She's had two concussions. She's had asthma since she was eight years old. She fell off the horses when she was six. She's had four severe falls. She says, I don't like it when it's raining outside. I'm a little claustrophobic. She doesn't uh, like blinds. She likes the windows open. She cares about people and animals. She tries to be kind. 
She says, I always, I always ask my patients what they feel is holding them back. And she said that fear is holding her back. She's serious and responsible, very driven. She doesn't like to fail. It's never been an option for her. Um, she wants to be alone when she's upset. And it takes a lot to make her upset. But then uh, she can get a temper tantrum and then feel guilty about her anger and apologize afterwards. Uh, she tends to be sloppy, but tends to prefer things to be neat. And she doesn't like clutter. Uh, she really likes to plan, but that leads to stress and anxiety. And she has very vivid dreams. She says, I see things in them, do things in them. And she says, this might be why I don't feel rested. She desires noodles, pasta, pizza, and bread. She says, I like yogurt. I eat it regularly. She says, I don't like asparagus. And she says, uh, I do wear sunglasses when I go outside. She says, salty foods are my preference. She says, I'm pretty thirsty. She likes water, which is room temperature. She doesn't like ice water unless she's been running. And she says her husband is the only person that she's had sexual relations with. She says, I'd like to have children. And then she says, I'm a very structured person, like to do things in order. Okay, so that's the case. What do you think I should focus on here? What do you see as being important? What symptoms strike you as being of interest? Okay, so I have a few here that I will um, okay. let you know. One is uh, if asthma is a secondary to suppression, eczema, etc., then it would be more tubercular or psoric in nature. Maybe early use of steroids suppressing maybe um, feeling better at night, aggravation of warmth, uh, the steroids were suppressive, vegetables ameliorate, issues since divorce, grief, desire for coffee worsens in the mornings due to her depression, grief, hidden grief, um, coffee, if homeopathic treatment works, if you drink so much, coffee what does what does the coffee tell you in terms of see the, the thing about the coffee is uh, the biggest problem with coffee is caffeine is a very strong diuretic so it's going to dehydrate your system so a lot of people who drink a lot of coffee tend to get very overly dehydrated that's just one general issue but the other thing is that coffee can not always but in some cases antidote the remedy so if she's i'm not going to can't tell her to just simply stop drinking coffee cold turkey. And since there is the possibility, I, I, it's not a guarantee, but since there's a possibility that the coffee could antidote the remedy, then I'm going to give the remedy daily to avoid it being antidoted. That's one of the things that that coffee tells me is that I have to give this remedy on a daily basis or multiple times in a day. <clears throat> Any other interesting symptoms? Uh, um that she craves for things that make her worse, for fatanaceous foods, divorce, her hidden grief, uh, focus on her grief, her headaches, her migraines. The... Okay, stop for a second. So look, if you just tell me headaches, migraines, that's it's not that it's untrue, it's just useless. But if you tell me headaches before a thunderstorm, that's useful to me. Because if I look at the rubric head pain, it's going to have like 800 remedies in it. It's not going to help me narrow down my choices. But head pain before a thunderstorm, I'm going to have, you know, 20, 30 remedies to choose from. So those types of symptoms are much more useful to me. Go ahead. We have another symptom from your friend, Richard, orderly structure. Okay. Um, her concussions, falling off yes. the horse. Yes. That she seems detached from her feelings. Yes. The way she talks about these. Uh, the weight on her chest. What? Listen, between location, sensation, and modalities, the most important is modalities in general. It depends on the case. But most of the time, modalities will be most important because it speaks directly to the sensitivity of the patient, what makes them feel better and what makes them feel worse. What are the strong modalities in this case relative to her asthma? When is she worse? Uh, wet weather. Wet weather, that's a very, she says it a number of times. Whenever the symptom repeats in the case, pay close attention. 
She repeatedly says that humid, warm, humid weather, rain aggravators. This, this is a, whatever remedy we're gonna give her, it should be a remedy that's aggravated by wet weather. She also says she's aggravated when, mostly. When is she worse? Morning, she's morning. worse better at night. Yeah, so whatever you do, you're gonna give a remedy that's worse in the morning and worse from wet weather. Uh, actually, she, yeah, go ahead. No, 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 go on. No, I was gonna say, actually, the, the remedy in this case is very obvious. You don't, you don't really even need to repertorize this case. It's extremely clear what remedy is indicated. Uh, I, will give you, I will give you some of the uh, suggested remedies from your uh, participants. Okay. Natrum sulfuricum pulsatilla, nat ignatia tuya staphysagria. Okay, so I can see these are all reasonable suggestions and I can see why all of these suggestions are being made, but this is very clearly a case of natrum sulfuricum, okay? There's a tremendous amount of information here that points to that remedy. Everything from the head injury, okay, where that could be the possible etiology for her asthma. Natural sulfuricum is a very important remedy for head injury, especially where after the head injury, they go into a state of depression or some type of change in their mental and emotional state. If they go into a kind of dependent childlike state after the head injury, you'll think of a more like a remedy like Sakuta Verosa, but if they become more depressed and despondent like this patient is, you'll think of natrium sulfuricum. Also, natrium sulfuricum has a very unusual symptom that even though they feel depressed and even suicidal, they won't do it because they'll tell you that they don't want to harm their friends and family member that they would leave behind. And she actually said that in this particular case. Also, natrium sulfuricum is a remedy that's very much aggravated by wet weather, uh, by is much very much aggravated in the morning, uh, tends to be very to get to blow up and then feel bad afterwards, tends to be very serious and responsible. Um, uh, so you can see uh, likes yogurt, you know, so. Uh, is affected by storms. So on and on and on, uh, everything here is clearly pointing to natrium sulfuricum. And natrium sulfuricum uh, is probably the number one remedy, in my opinion, for the treatment of asthma. Obviously, we need to individualize each case and look at the specific symptoms of what remedy they point to. But I can tell you that a very large percentage of cases will respond favorably to natrium sulfuricum. And especially, it's very well indicated for children. I can't give you an exact percentage, but maybe 30% or 40% of all children with asthma will respond favorably to natrium sulfuricum. So very, very important remedy in the treatment of chronic asthma. Let's go ahead now and um, let me just show you the symptoms that I highlighted here. You can see, she says, every morning have to use the inhaler. So morning aggravation. Asthma is aggravated by warmth and humid weather. Uh, she drinks a lot of coffee, which tells me that I'm going to have to repeat this remedy frequently. Worse in the morning, she says it again. Uh, not a very emotional person. Don't tend to cry a lot. Gets headaches before her period every month. Storms bring on the headaches. Headaches before the storms. Has a depression state. Uh, more about the depression. And didn't want to be with friends. Kinds of reminds you of natrium muriaticum, right? But natrium sulfuricum can also have a version to consolation. Uh, depressed. And here we see, but suicide would be such a selfish thing to do to the people who love you. Very characteristic of natrium sulfuricum. Uh, and then we've got the whole thing about desire to be in control. Very characteristic of this remedy. Worse in the morning. Uh, sticks her feet out from the covers like sulfur does doesn't like humid weather, the fall from uh, with the head injury and the concussions, the worst from the rain outside, um, serious and responsible, wants to be alone and liking yogurt. So you can see uh, photophobia is also a symptom of natrium sulfuricum and then being very structured, likes to do things in order. So very, very clearly, this is a case where we need to give natrium sulfuricum. So let's look at the follow-up. So because of the drinking of coffee and because this is a chronic case where she's had these problems for almost 20 years, I want to give her a low potency, which I repeat frequently because 
Um, I know that that it's going to take a while to resolve her health issues, and I want a lot of room to move up in the potency. So I'm going to start with a fairly low potency, and I'm going to repeat that three times a day, TID, uh, so they don't have to worry about the coffee potentially antidoting the remedy. Here's a repertorization. It's just, you can see, tons of symptoms. It's very, very clear that this is a case of natural sulfuricum. You don't, you don't even need a wonderful program like Vitolka's Compass in this particular case to get a suggestion of natural sulfuricum. You need, you need Vitolka's Compass for those cases where the remedy is some poorly represented remedy like Aurelia racemosa or Lobelian flata, where a flat repertorization is just simply not going to tell you the remedy. Okay, so the first follow-up is two months after starting the remedy, and she says the asthma is a little bit better not feeling as smothered as before. She says her skin has cleared up. She, I guess, has some eczema that she hadn't really mentioned previously. Um, and she's super light sensitive, especially around 4 p.m. Now, my question to the audience at this point is, is this the wrong direction? I mean, you know, according to Herring's law, right? Herring's law says you go from in reverse order of appearance, the symptoms return in reverse order of appearance, the symptoms go, for, as the, the patient's getting better, they go from the top down, from the inside out, and from more important organs to less important organs. And yet here, the skin is clearing up, and the skin is on the outside, certainly a less important organ than the lungs. So my question to you, is this the reverse and problematic? Is this not following Herring's law? What do you think? So here I have various answers. Wrong okay. direction. Wrong direction. The skin, okay. the skin should become towards the end, should become better okay. towards the end. Yeah. The asthma is getting better. Because she's had asthma since since she was a kid, reversing time. Um there are questions about her mental health. What about her mental health? I mean, there's no mention on that. There's no change in the mental state. I, I put down what's what's different, basically. And basically that everybody uh basically agrees that the skin should be the last. Okay, that is generally true, okay? And if this case, in this case, during the first follow-up, the asthma had gotten worse and then the skin had cleared up, I would definitely be concerned. But the fact that the asthma is also getting better, I don't care that the skin has improved, okay? So in this particular situation, I'm going to continue, okay? And the truth of the matter is that we, for the most part, misunderstand and misrepresent Herring's law of cure. The first thing is that it's not Herring's. It's really James Tyler Kent. It was something that he presented at the second lecture of the postgraduate school, where he says the cure must proceed from center to circumference, from center to circumference is from above downward, from within outwards, from more important to less important organs, and from head to the hands and the feet. And so it's really Kent's and not Herring's. The second issue is that we don't always see this in practice. Now remember that in Herring's law, we've got four things, from above downwards, from within outwards, from more important to less important organs, and in reverse order of appearance. Well, let me give you an example from my practice from many, many years ago. I had a patient who came in to see me who had terrible stomach pains. I took her case and I decided to prescribe for her the remedy Natrum Muriaticum. I gave her Natrum Muriaticum and her stomach pains disappeared but she became very depressed. Now you would assume that if the stomach symptoms went away and the mind became depressed, that that's the reverse of the direction that we want to see because the mind is a more internal organ, more important than would be the stomach. And therefore it seems to go against Herring's law of cure or Kent's law of cure. But in this particular case, what had happened was that a year previously, the patient had gotten gone through a very difficult divorce. 
And after the divorce, she had become very depressed. And then over a period of time, the depression disappeared and she developed the stomach problems. So when I gave her the natrium muriaticum and the stomach problems disappeared and the depression or grief returned, it was simply the reverse order of appearance. So sometimes the reverse order of appearance will be different from the other supposed laws of Herring's law. Reverse order of appearance always supersedes the other three. It's always the most important. So Herring's other principles or supposed laws don't always apply if reverse order of appearance is there. And it's not always seen, even the even the reverse order of appearance is not always seen. So certainly not in acutes. If you have a, a patient who has a, let's say some type of infectious condition where they have a fever followed by a chill, followed by perspiration, when you give them their acute remedy, you don't expect to see those symptoms in reverse order where the perspiration disappears and then the chill comes back and then the fever returns. We don't see that at all. The symptoms simply resolve. So we don't see the even the reverse order of appearance in acutes. So the truth of the matter is that Herring's law is not a law, that perfect cases where we see all of these are actually quite rare. It does sometimes happen. We certainly see reverse order of appearance in some situations, but we don't see it in all situations. So this is something we observe sometimes. It's really something that we have to attribute to Kent. It's there, but it doesn't have to appear. And because in this particular case, the asthma is still getting better, I have no problems at all with the skin symptoms resolving. Hahnemann actually in aphorism 225 alludes to this as well, where he talks about, in aphorisms 210 through 230, Hahnemann talks about psychosomatic diseases, and he also talks about somatopsychic diseases. In other words, diseases that start on the mental realm and progress to the physical realm, or diseases that start on the physical realm and progress to the mental and emotional realm. So again, these can move in any direction depending on the particular situation. Okay, the second follow. Kim, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, so this is the second follow-up. This is five months after starting the remedy. The asthma is still there, but it is better than before. And she says, better than what it was last year at this time. And she says, I have weird dreams waking up crying about a patient or their owner. She's a, she's a veterinarian um, okay. practitioner. So she's talking about her patients. Okay. So um, I don't know what people think about this. Okay. She's taking natrium sulfuricum 6C three times a day. What would you like to do in such a situation? Any suggestions? I don't see any suggestions for now, Kim. Okay. I think it's fairly obvious that the fact that this is this is the patient's definitely getting better the, the fact that they're better at this that this time this as they were last year at the same time that's a very good sign so uh, you could potentially go up in potency to a 12c but as long as the patient's improving i tend to keep everything the same so i just continued with the 6c three times a day the third follow-up is now six months after starting the remedy. She says the asthma is still much better than before, but now has developed a discharge from the vagina, which is very pungent. This is a real problem as I have become sexually active again. So uh, what would you suggest we do here? Now, every, all the symptoms are the same. So there's no change in the symptom picture, but the one new thing that has developed is um, this discharge from her vagina, which is, has a very strong odor to it. So what do you suggest I do here? Uh, many of your participants say to wait, that you're doing, you're going in the right direction. Yes, I completely agree. It would be a mistake at this point to prescribe for the odor from the vag vag vaginal area. Very often when you're giving uh, the right remedy or a good remedy prescription, what you will see is the body will begin to detoxify itself. Um, I, I share this story. I, I, many years ago, I had these terrible back problems and um, 
it was terrible. I mean, I couldn't like sit or walk or talk or anything. It was just awful. And uh, a, a friend of mine, a colleague suggested a particular remedy and I took the remedy and I, um, after taking the remedy, I became very, very nauseous and I began to vomit and violently and like, you know, something out of the exorcist. And I was vomiting for like an hour straight. And after that vomiting, I was like 90% better. And I woke up the next morning completely asymptomatic, no symptoms whatsoever. And I have seen this frequently in practice where you give a remedy and the, the, just, the body will begin to throw out the toxins of the system. And that's part of the healing process. I had a, a case of a patient who had these terrible facial grimaces and I ended up giving him Cupra Metallicum and it completely cured the facial grimaces. Uh, he, he was a young man of about the age of 13. His acne got much, much worse. The, the mother said, please prescribe for the acne. I said, no, that would be an error. Uh, she went and took the, the young boy uh, to the allopathic physician. He prescribed some cortical uh, steroids, suppressed the acne and completely antidoted the remedy. And he actually ended up in the hospital with a psychotic breakdown. So uh, very, very careful in these types of circumstances not to suppress the expression of discharges from the body. So we continue in this particular situation. Okay. All right. So uh, that's my presentation. Um, I'd like to now open it up for any questions about anything that I presented, or if you have any just general questions um, about homeopathy that you'd like me to address, I would be happy to do so. We only have about uh, five minutes or so, but again, before we do so, I'd, I'd like to thank Patolka's Compass uh, for giving me the opportunity to share a little bit uh, from my own uh, clinical experience with homeopathy. And I think um, I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen now, uh, uh, and uh, I'll let Elena share her screen, and I'm happy to entertain any questions that anybody has. Thank you, Kim. This was really a fantastic and a really great first webinar. It was an amazing lecture and both these all cases were extremely interesting with their follow-ups. And as always, you know I'm a fan of yours. Uh, an outstanding I'm presentation. I'm a fan of yours. <laughs> it was an outstanding presentation. And I have to say that we have practically 300 people in the in, in, in this lecture and everybody's expressing their appreciation for your most inspiring presentation so Kim thank you so so much and we will be, and we will be having another presentation another session with you later on in a couple of months and I want everybody to know this that this will be we will have another presentation with Kim and we will of course inform you in due time. Meanwhile, because of this presentation, because of Kim and uh, his knowledge, we are offering a 20% discount on the purchase of six to 12 month uh, plan subscriptions. So anybody interested, we will be very happy to accommodate and you can uh, contact us at sales at vithulkascompass.com. So this is all from me. Thank you, Kim, very much once again. Thank you. My pleasure. Very much. It was an honor for us to have you, and we hope to see you, have you soon again with us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for all the participants, and I want to wish everybody a very happy new year and look forward to doing another one of these in the future. Thank you, Kim. Goodbye Bye, to everyone. all, and see you soon. Bye-bye, everybody.